Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, July 26, 2016. It is 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Advancement Live. I am Kim Brown, and today we are doing an encore presentation of a presentation that the three of us, myself and my two guests, did last week at the Case Summit. It was just such a hit that we knew we had to do it over again. Um, I wanted to share it with all of you. I'm just kidding, of course, but we're excited to talk about how we connect digital engagement initiatives and the work we do in the digital space with the bottom line for our institutions. Of course, we hear all the time about time, about talent, about treasure. How does the work that we're doing in the digital space in those different areas, time, talent, and treasure, connect in with our bottom line? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at some recent digital campaigns. And, uh, and go through some of the metrics that we gathered, the success stories that we have, and hopefully you will all find it helpful. Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. It offers viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in our industry. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro. It is the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. And all episodes of Advancement Live are free. They're accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast format, format on iTunes. And today's episode is made possible by a company that is very busy at this moment, iModules, right now running their Sizzler 16 conference iModulars uh, Module Software is the leading constituent engagement management provider for educational institutions. iModules delivers an integrated online platform transforming how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. And of course, Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. So I will now no more spiel about sponsorship. I will now introduce one person who needs no introduction. You all know him as another co-host co of Advancement Live. He is Andrew Gosen. He is Executive Director of Digital for Cornell University, their Division of Alumni Affairs and Development. He has a strong alumni relations background, and he is interested in the intersection between community, communication, and technology. And someone who is doing her first Advancement Live episode with us today, we're thrilled to have her, Kristen Gowan. She is Associate Director of Media Relations and Social Media at Union College. She provides strategic social media planning for the college with special consideration given to growing audiences and building brand awareness for Union. So we all got to see everybody in person last week. How are you all doing in the last week? Good. Good. Andrew. Andrew's got some uh, exciting news for his family. Andrew, you want to give a little uh, shout out to the newest <laughs> member? That's right. The newest member is a Bernie's Mountain Dog puppy who is now 12 days old, and we're going to be able to bring him home on September 15th. Yay! Awesome. Congratulations. To to all upstate New York, Kim, Kim and Kristen, you're more than welcome to come visit. Oh, we like it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, good. So we, were, uh, we joked last week when we were uh, all together that we're really representing the uh, the cold both that uh, we've got Albany represented Ithaca and Syracuse so hopefully you're watching us from somewhere warm I don't know about you guys but it's about 90 degrees where we are today so roasty toasty summer in central and southern and western and eastern New York and all that jazz so anyway I'm gonna jump right into it uh, we do have a lot of slides that we've prepared for uh, this episode and so we're able to show you a little bit of what we're talking about and again as I mentioned it's really going to focus on time, talent, and treasure. What's the digital work that we're doing in those different areas and then how are we able to work with our leadership to have them understand that the work we're doing really does impact the bottom line for our, our institution. So I'm going to start with Andrew. Uh, Andrew has a very fancy Mac computer so he's going to be able to show the slides uh, for our presentation today with ease. And I figure, Andrew, we'll start uh, with time and digital volunteerism. And that's a phrase that is very familiar to you at Cornell. So can you talk a little bit about where that came from and what that means at Cornell? Sure, yeah. I mean, obviously one of the core elements of a... We have an interesting echo thing going on there. One of the core elements of alumni relations for probably a hundred years at this point, actually it could go even farther back to the mid-19th century when Yale alumni first got organized, 
Um, one of the unique things about higher ed in the U.S. is the extent to which alumni get themselves organized and volunteer on behalf of their fellow alumni and their alma mater. So alumni like doing this. It's something that we as alumni affairs and advancement professionals have been taking advantage of for a long time. And that's presented us with all sorts of benefits. Uh, you think about boards, you think about steering committees, you think about fundraising volunteers. Volunteers have played an essential role in the success of many of our institutions for decades at this point. Um, but one of the, the limitations of the existing volunteer structure as advancement has known it is that there are some fundamental limitations to, to what it can do. There are some limitations to the population that it can serve. Um, for instance, alumni volunteerism in general requires that the volunteers have a certain amount of free time. It requires that they live in a place where there's a critical mass of their fellow alumni. It usually requires some measure of affinity with official alumni organizations. And it also requires a certain amount of affinity for traditional events, roles, and experiences. So if you um, don't like attending meetings, if you don't like reading meeting minutes, so on and so forth, um, it may be that, that conventional alumni volunteer roles are not uh, necessarily aligned with you. And I think this is an issue because these traditional volunteer roles are becoming increasingly less and less aligned with a lot of how we know our alumni are beginning to spend their time. Um, for instance, we know that our alumni are increasingly busy, uh, which means they don't necessarily have the time to invest in these sort of things. They are very geographically dispersed, living and working all over the world, um, which means that they may not be living near that critical mass of alumni, which is necessary for several conventional volunteer roles. And especially as you get into some of the younger generations, they're increasingly inclined and motivated and able to do things their way if the institution isn't meeting them where they are on their terms. So the thing that we're really excited about when it comes to digital volunteerism is that there's a chance that volunteer opportunities on digital may address all of these problems at once. In the sense that digital volunteer opportunities don't necessarily have to take up a lot of time. Right. You can do them from wherever you happen to be living or working at the moment. And it's a, it's a sort of bite-sized volunteer opportunity that we think has real promise to make it possible for more people to volunteer on behalf of the alma mater than, than is the case if we rely exclusively on um, the conventional volunteer opportunities that have actually served us very well for a long time. Well, boom. So that is uh, that is quite the explanation. And so what you've gone with is uh, something called social toaster. I love that concept. Um, and I know you've got a, a slide where you can show you know what this means and the reach of the different networks that your alumni have. So kind of talk us through that portion of it. And and you know alumni can give back from time, from talent, from treasure. But as you said, also with the networks that they have, right? Sure. So let me see if I can pull up the relevant slide here. Perfect. So we'll fast forwarding. Um, here we go. So what we're talking about, as you can see in this screen, we're talking about asking people to invest the networks that they've built up on their social media platforms on behalf of the institution. Um, this isn't necessarily a totally new concept. In fact, if you let me pop back a, a couple Look of slides. Oh, we popped too what far. We're, what we're doing is we're asking our alumni to serve as brand ambassadors on behalf of the university online. And some people hear the word brand ambassador, and they kind of seize up, and they think, wow, that's new. That's scary. How are we going to wrap our heads around it? Um, if you can look at my friend Bob Mueller here from the class of 41. He's the president. Uh, we've had alumni serving as brand ambassadors on behalf of our institutions once again for decades. Uh, Bob is as loyal a uh, Cornelian as we could possibly uh, ever hope to encounter. He's always out there with his Cornell gear. He's, he's telling people about the fact that he's affiliated with an alma mater he loves very much. And all we're doing with this brand ambassador online idea is taking that sort of enthusiasm and willingness to communicate on behalf of the institution, and we're taking it online. So if you look at this graphic, this is Social Toaster's description of how the process works. You have a person who's a fan. You invite them to serve as a fan or a social media ambassador. That's the term that we have chosen to use on Social Toaster. 
And then they connect the social media networks of their choice to the platform, and then we send them content that we would like them to share on behalf of Cornell. The neat thing about this and the reason that this can be such a time efficient and time effective way of volunteering is that when we send content out to our ambassadors to ask them to share, they receive an email that actually very clearly maps out exactly what that content is going to look like on the social networks that they've connected to the platform. And all they have to do is click on that Share Now button that you see on the screen. And they've already authorized the, net, the platforms to share on their behalf. So it gets pushed out to their, to their followers, to their friends. Um, but the cool thing is that it appears in the news feed as though it's just another post from them. And you have to be pretty savvy to look closely enough to see that it says via Social Toaster. And uh, that means that somebody can actually play a relevant volunteer role for us in the 10 seconds it takes to open up the email on your iPhone when you're commuting. You're in the subway, you hit share, boom, off it goes. And uh, one of the things that we like to do here in uh, Cornell Alumni Affairs and Development Social Media HQ is we always have TweetDeck open whenever we, we send out a share request. And you can see the sharing activity start almost immediately. And there's this immediate... Uh, sort of crescendo of it. It tends to last for five to six hours, and then um, slowly over the course of 48 hours, it dies off. But it's an amazing thing to see. I love it. So tell me, and Kristen, I know you're still there. We're gonna we're gonna get over to Treasure soon. Um, but tell me, what's in it for them? Like, what's in it for your for your social media ambassadors? Is it do they receive free invites to events? Is it swag that they get from Cornell? Um, what's the what's the prize factor if there is one? There is swag, and from what we hear from Social Toaster, <clears throat> the swag is a much more important piece of the way that their private sector clients use the tool than it is for us. Uh, there are leaderboards. You can have competitions that revolve around all sorts of different types of recruiting or sharing activities, and we do that to a certain extent. Uh, we like people to feel like there there is something in it for them, um, but we don't think that's the primary motivation for people volunteering on behalf of Cornell this way. And this is something that I think is, is substantiated by the analysis we've done of how people have shared different types of content when we send it on out there. Mm. This initiative is almost two years old at this point, and it's very clear that the content that gets shared is when people feel like they're helping Cornell business get done. Sometimes that can happen in the context of a fundraising campaign, like a giving day. Sometimes it happens in the context of a, a, a sort of crisis management or messaging situation. Um, we had an episode uh, the past year where there was a, an announcement of a major university initiative that wasn't rolled out as elegantly as, as we would hope. it might have been able to be. Um, so there was a need to do some backfilling and bring people in the loop and give them a chance to make it feel like, make them feel like their voices were actually being, being heard. So the social media ambassadors were tremendously valuable pushing that out there. Uh, presidential welcome tours, things like that. Those are the sorts of things people like to share, and we think that's because they feel like they're helping Cornell get done what we need to get done. Well, before we jump over to, to Kristen, because I want to focus on Giving Day at Union, um, slide 15 for you talks about the use case where you use Social Toaster on your Giving Day. Can you just talk through a little bit um, of those results and how that really helped to, as so many of us are being um, gently nudged by our leadership to put on giving days at our institutions, how did Social Toaster amplify uh, or help with those efforts at Cornell? Sure, let me click through to that slide. Here we go. Okay, so you can see the metrics that we track. Um, 173 shares, 336 clicks, um, 137 pieces of engagement, and 14,000 impressions. Uh, this was just another part of a full corporate marketing press to make sure that no Cornellian anywhere on the internet would be unaware that <laughs> it was taking place on April 19th, um, 2016. Now, using social media ambassadors is not the only thing to do. This is part of an integrated marketing campaign. Uh, but the reality is that even if you've got a campaign that's based heavily on email and paid social, there's still little pockets out there where you're not going to reach. And by having people who are part of your community already sharing this content with their networks, which are going to have a disproportionate number of fellow alumni in them. Um, that helped us extend the word of, of Giving Day into parts of the, of the internet that it wouldn't have reached otherwise. 
Um, if you take your Google Analytics seriously, you can actually connect all of this activity to your analytics and start answering some very specific questions about how an initiative like this has impacted, um, impacted the overall traffic on the day. For instance, in this particular scenario, we know this email produced 211 sessions and almost $10,000 in revenue from the ambassadors alone, so that's before they even shared it. And then we know that the sharing activity they did, the, the posts that popped up in their, in their uh, status updates and then showed up in the news feeds of their friends um, on Facebook, uh, produced 51 unique sessions on the Giving Day site and almost $2,500 in revenue. And on Twitter, it was 50 sessions and a lesser number of revenue. It was only $600 in that case. Um, but if you tie all of the pipes together correctly, you can now start giving your, your management very precise numbers about how these initiatives support broader campaigns like the Giving Day campaign. Yeah, and that's what this show is all about. You know, how does this tie into our bottom line? And when you can give those numbers and say, hey, look, we had our ambassador share this and it resulted in this many thousands of dollars, um, I think that's what all of us are looking for at our institution. So now I'm going to jump over from a Cornell institution to a smaller institution to Union College uh, and to my friend Kristen. Kristen, you need a huge budget to do social media advertising, right? <laughs> No, you actually that's the, I think that's the great equalizer about social media is that we're able to take small budgets and small teams and have great impact just like Cornell is seeing. We have seen some great impact whether it be on our giving day or smaller campaigns. I think having a small spirited team can be just as great as having a large team as well. So I think it's kind of been a good equalizer against small schools versus large schools, but we've definitely seen some great results. Well, I am very envious that you guys are already using Giving Tree. That's something we're trying to move uh, towards here at Syracuse University. That's a product from Evertrue. And I'll have Andrew pull up uh, slide 31, which is a post that you did about a year ago, almost a year ago to the date, mm -hmm. uh, a TBT post of one of your professors. Talk through that, and then after you show folks what the, uh, what the post was, if you could just share the results from that post and how that tied into Giving Tree or how Giving Tree helped you to find those results. Definitely. So the goal of this Facebook post was to identify new donors for a professorship that we were working on here that was partially funded at Union. So it was in the name of Joe Board, who was the head of our political science department. He had worked at Union a long time as the pre-law society advisor. He had gone on terms abroad. So we knew he had touched a lot of students' lives or alumni's lives when he was here, so we really wanted to kind of identify those folks and then put them through our system, whether it was major gifts or an annual fund gift, that kind of thing. So what we did was we put up this post. It was just a classic Throwback Thursday. We know our Union College Facebook audience loves Throwback Thursday posts. Uh, Union has been around since 1795, so that is a lot of fodder for Throwback Thursday. It's a lot of throwing back. Yes. <laughs> throwing back. <laughs> so, uh, we put the post up and saw a lot of great engagement. I actually boosted the post, spent only $200 on this, so we're talking small budget here. And I think the results for us were really great. Um, if you can flip to the next slide, uh, the post reached 22,000 people. We saw 375 likes, 14 shares, 24 comments. But most importantly, we were able to use Giving Tree and match our constituents to that engagement on Facebook, and that's really where we can make that connection. Uh, we reached 96 constituents out of that Facebook post for a lifetime giving total of about $2 million, averaging $21,000 per person, and it ended up yielding us 34 rated prospects. So people we know that have a visit from a major gift officer, talk about the impact that Joe Board had on their life, and talk to them about making a gift to this professorship. So to those folks who say to us, I mean, your job is basically to be on Facebook all day. <laughs> what do you say? Yes, it is, but <laughs> the proof it's, is in. Yes, I am on Facebook all day, but I'm on Facebook with your rated prospects, the people who are really can make a difference financially and philanthropically in this school, which I think is such a great initiative here. 
So you did a Giving Day, your first one, right? It was back in April for, for Union. Was that the first one or was that number two? This is our, actually, this is our third year doing Giving Day. Um, oh, just kidding. We were very lucky to do our very first Giving Day the Tuesday before we went on to play for the National Hockey Championship. So it is a wonderful time to do your Giving Day. <laughs> Everybody should schedule it before a D1 Hockey Championship. Um, this is our third this year, and it went really, really well. I think Andrew is, was hit the nail right on the head when he talked about the importance of your social media ambassadors and the importance of having your community tell the story. I think is just critical when it comes to a giving day. Um, you can actually skip just to the, uh, a couple slides there. And you want to go to 33, a day for you? 30. Yes, 33. So we had a day for you on April 6th, and when we talk, when I talk about digital strategy for a day for you, this really just comes down to this is just a piece of the pie of the whole a day for you day. It's a whole hands-on deck for us in college relations, and everybody is just manning the phones, managing volunteers, getting the word out. So my job is to engage our community digitally, and really what that comes down to is putting out fun content people want to share, people want to talk about and getting them excited that this is the day where we celebrate not just making a gift to Union, but celebrate our pride in the institution and that we are excited about the direction that it's moving forward. So I talk a lot about, in the next slide actually, the importance of the good old-fashioned FOMO of getting people really excited to make a gift, not only make a gift, but also advocate on our behalf, share it to their social networks, and get everybody really excited that this is the day that we celebrate your union pride. Most specifically, we used the Give Campus platform this year, and if you could just skip forward two slides to the we did it section. We can talk about um, the we used Give Campus, and the platform allows you to kind of create advocates, and they sign up, and everybody gets a personalized link, so you're able to track their success. How many clicks do they have to our site? How many gifts were made? from an advocate's link. So we were able to track that we received 366 gifts that day thanks to our advocates and them, and them sharing their link. And also about 2100 clicks to our site based on advocates. So we were able this to raise over a million dollars in one day. And Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is not a formalized, um, similar to, so Andrew has Social Toaster down at Cornell. This yep. wasn't a formalized social media ambassador program, right? This kind of d just develops? No. We had basically reached out to our annual fund office has a great core of volunteers when it comes to class volunteers. So they all reached out to their volunteers uh, leading into it, sharing them um, social media assets. So change your profile picture, change your cover photo, and then share this content. That day. So we came in with a small group of, you know, basically our uh, social media ambassadors of the day, but we don't have at this point, but I really want to check into it, a formalized digital engagement program similar to what they have at the now, because I think that is just amazing. Andrew, how are you? And you can pop off the, uh, the PowerPoint so we can see your face. Um, how are you identifying your social media ambassadors? Uh, are they self-identifying? Are you, did you, like when you first started this, for schools who are thinking, I want to do that now, um, how, are you, how are you starting that? It's sort of a two-pronged approach. Uh, we started off with a core group of alumni volunteers. We have an annual leadership conference for the volunteers. And it made sense that if you've got all of your class and club and affinity uh, group leaders right there, that those are the kind of people you'd like to get on board early on in the process. So we launched the program there, and they got on board. But then as they start sharing content, it's published in a frame that has a link at the bottom saying this is shared through uh, Cornell Social. That's the, the official uh, name that we, we've given the program inside the Cornell community. And people can click through, and then they can join themselves. So I think it makes all sorts of sense to start with your, your core of volunteers, if you have one. Um, but then there's a certain amount of organic uh, dissemination of the idea, and people come and they join organically as you go along. So just catching a couple tweets from from Erica. She's got a meeting at two o'clock today, so she's watching our show right before it. And at that two o'clock meeting, she's uh, reviewing vendors for a new social media ambassador program. So Erica, 
we did this for you. You're you're fully prepared to go into that meeting knowing some of this uh, background from Andrew and his experience. And a question too that came in from my friend Jesse, our friend Jesse, since all of us know him at Evertrue. You know, we all know the three of us, and and probably many of us watching this show, this episode. We all know the power of social. I mean, I know that we're we're giving all these case studies. What's the best way that both of you have found to convince your leadership, guys? I'm not just tweeting all day long. Like, what I do is valuable to you. Was there any like aha moment that either one of you uh, had in your work? I think for us, it's just been showing these specific case studies and showing impact. I think when you can tie data to dollars, I think that is the best thing that you could ever do to show engagement in the X to the Y to the Z, and this is how we're using it. I think showing how engaged a person is is a good measure of whether they'll make a gift as well if we're talking fundraising. Um, it, I believe we have been interested from Evertrue people who had over 100 likes on our Facebook page are 45% more likely to make a gift to the annual fund, I think that's a great reaction right there. Andrew, how about you? Well, I think it's really important to try to talk to the people at the highest levels in terms that they clearly understand. I mean, that was the original idea behind the way we framed up this presentation for Case, um, talking about the time and the talent and the treasure and trying to connect the dots. Um, because everybody at the highest level has already conceded that time, talent, and treasure are sort of at the core of the advancement enterprise, right? So no one's going to quibble about do we need volunteers or not. No one's going to quibble about do we need dollars. No one's going to quibble about do we need to leverage the talent that's inherent in our alumni body. So I think if you can, you can articulate what you're doing and express the impact in those terms, that gets you uh, farther down the road than any other approach that I've encountered. Uh, but that said, I think for our team, the the sort of eureka moment on the part of our, our former VP uh, came during our sesquicentennial year, which was 2015, and we had a full corporate multi-channel press going on literally for a year, and I think the moment that it finally clicked for him, why we didn't tell him this was so exciting all these, all these years was when um, we had a, a big celebration down in New York, and the Empire State Building got lit up with uh, Cornell Red and White, and that photo went viral and he actually could see it. He could see people all over the world suddenly simultaneously chiming in. And I think that was the moment when he understood at a visceral level that there is in fact a global conversation about our institutions going on and that that's an opportunity that we have to take advantage of if we're serious about advancement goals. Awesome. Kristen, you had a, a bit of a viral moment too. Uh, slide 35, the photo that you, I love that picture. Tell us about your your Star Wars viral moment at Union. So talking a little bit about um, creating content that you want people to share throughout your giving day, this was a piece that literally I didn't even pay a graphic designer to make this. It was a student who works here in our communications office who just made this hysterical photo. Um, we have a campaign here at Union called It's Hashtag Not Shot. So you visit Union, take your knot shot. It's always a great picture of the Knot Memorial, which is the center of our campus. It is a symbol of Union College that our alumni know. And we kind of blended it together with, a, first of all, Star Wars is very well known, obviously, in pop culture, but also the voice of BB-8 is a Union alum, or half of the voice of BB-8 or whatever is a Union alum, Ben Schwartz. So we were able to kind of tie everything together share this photo, share it with Ben, who also reacted, and just to be able to share it all over, and people think it's hysterical, this is what you want your giving day to be. You want it to be not just about giving, but positive, good vibes, great digital content that people want to share throughout the day. Awesome. One piece of um, feedback that I hear on, on these giving days is it's one thing to have everybody sharing the great images and sharing the great videos that you've created. It's another thing to get that to directly correlate to actually clicking, make a gift. <laughs> like, give now. Please give to our giving day. Um, so, yes, thank you for sharing our picture, but now click one more time. Um, any strategies on, on how to encourage that, that next step? Andrew, I'll start with you on, on that question. I think clear call to actions are essential. I mean, if you're hoping that they'll, they'll 
guess from the content what you would like them to do. That's not, <laughs> that's not a reliable approach. I mean, hope is not a strategy, right? <laughs> uh, so I think that, and then a pretty watertight uh, tracking system that lets you begin to do A-B testing and figure out what the right way to make the ask is on various different channels about various different topics. Um, that way you actually have tangible evidence pointing you in the direction of what works. And then you just do more of what does work and less of what doesn't. Do you find on Social Toaster, Andrew, and then, and then Chris and I definitely want you to weigh in on this, do you find that... Yeah, to me, LinkedIn is a, a hugely untapped resource because that's where all of our working professionals are. Do you find that one platform does better than the others uh, across your social media ambassador program? At Facebook, maybe, because more people are on there. Have you seen anything um, or, or looked at those different channels? Facebook dominates by a wide margin, and okay. then Twitter and then LinkedIn. I mean, I, I feel that because... Personally, I've now managed this program, and then I've, I've participated as a volunteer in a Social Toaster initiative that was recently run by, by my alma mater. And in neither case did I connect LinkedIn because that's not the kind of stuff I share on LinkedIn. Got it. I mean, I think that's going to vary considerably from person to person. But just looking at the number of people who've connected Facebook and Twitter versus LinkedIn within the Cornell Social Program, it's clear that a lot of people, that's... I don't know what the right metaphor is, mixing work and pleasure, or mixing your volunteer life with your professional life. Um, but I think we need to, A, be attuned to that, and B, respect people's choices. Awesome. Kristen, any, any thoughts on the, the call to action and ensuring that the great content is shared, but that it also leads to that next step? I think what Andrew said is, is spot on. I think you need to be super clear that, obviously, this is the giving day. You need to consider making a gift and sharing the content. I think one thing that people can do in a strategy that they can use even after the giving day, take a look at everybody who liked all of your content throughout the giving day, whether they interacted you, with you on Twitter or on Facebook, and then follow up with you. Did they make a gift? If they did make a gift, throw them into the community pool and give them a call and say, hey, you know, we realized you, know, you liked our photo on Facebook during giving day. We were hoping that maybe you could have a chance tonight to, to make a gift tonight. So... I think really following up and circling back with the engagement and the people who are engaging with you that day is crucial, kind of closing that loop and really making that connection. Awesome. Well, I'm going to blabber for just a quick second on, on my section of our presentation. I was on the talent side of things, having come out of career services. So, Andrew, if you could pull up slide uh, 23 and our friend Sally there. Um, this was uh, a program that we started in the career services office uh, at here at Syracuse, and it was the Working Orange Twitter handle, which I think that um, some of our viewers will be familiar with. And, and what that Twitter handle is, it's an opportunity for our alumni to share a day in the life of what they do. And what we found through that program is that alumni really enjoy talking about their experiences and they really, really enjoy getting positive feedback from our students and fellow alumni. So on the anniversary uh, of when we had created it, we put together a blog post where alumni were reflecting on that whole experience with you know, being on the Working Orange Twitter handle. I actually just caught a tweet yesterday. I wonder if I can pull it up right away. One of our alumni, he just tweeted, he just graduated in 2016, and he said, my next goal to tweet a day in the life for at Working Orange. So this, we found, is something that our alumni uh, aspire to do. They set it as, as goals for their professional lives. And we did this blog post and really just wanted them to share with us what that experience was like. And in, in preparing for this presentation, um, I looked at the 24 alumni who we had posted about in that blog post. And 10 of them had made a gift to Syracuse University since doing Working Orange. One's father is the CFO of a venture capital firm. He's now a rated prospect for us. Uh, another hosted a group of students at Google. One ended up signing an alum at his agency, and that alum is now doing play-by-play -play for ESPN. Uh, another did a Google Plus Hangout for us, uh, offering advice to graduating seniors. And then another hosted students at her company, which is LinkedIn. And so to us, that's a really cool uh, engagement opportunity because they're sharing that talent 
side of things. And it's not that they're maybe making their gift yet. It's not that they're giving a ton of their time. But in being able to offer those career experiences to students, I think that helps uh, reignite their passion for their alma mater. And eventually, if down the line, that means that that will translate into a gift to the university or some other way of giving back, such as hosting a ton of students at your company, um, that to us was was really important in looking at the talent side of things, if that all makes sense. The other um, slide I just want to touch on is slide number 26, Andrew, and that is the uh, higher higher orange program that we started here at the university, which again is just an easy way. If you can have an alum realize that because of a tweet that they saw, they landed a job at their dream company, um, they're probably going to feel pretty connected to their alma mater for the rest of their life. So Higher Orange is the hashtag that we use for job opportunities that are from Syracuse grads, for Syracuse grads, or current students. Um, they're posted across Twitter. They can be emailed in. My colleague now in Career Services, Jenna, does a fantastic job of curating these, getting them up on LinkedIn. This is so easy for any university to, to emulate, to follow, um, just to be able to get those job opportunities and share them within the network. And that really is you know, so much of what we heard at Case Summit and at, at all of these conferences is how are we providing continued value to our alumni long after they've left our respective campuses. And, a job that's pretty darn valuable. So if we can figure out how to use digital to tap into that, to make that process easier, to facilitate that, to not have them have to log into some antiquated system to search job opportunities, but instead can just click a hashtag on Twitter, um, that I think is something that we're going to want to focus on moving forward as well. So that is my little spiel. On the, on the talent side of things. And I want to remind folks, uh, as you're watching, if you have any questions for us or if you have a comment about something that you've seen, uh, a digital initiative that really ties into the bottom line for your institution, please do tweet it to us using the hashtag Higher Ed Live because we certainly want to hear those. Uh, I want to quickly now um, ask some of the questions that came up during our presentation because they were good ones and I think we had some good discussion um, about those. And the first is, Andrew, how are you? You're doing weekly emails. I know you on, on Wednesdays, you're sending out your social toaster emails. Of all of the things that are happening on campus, how do you figure out what to uh, put in those weekly emails suggesting content for your ambassadors to share? Sure. We actually last year sat down and put together a content calendar for the entire year, primarily sitting down with partner program areas throughout Alumni Affairs and Development. We were trying to figure out what their top of mind priorities were at various points in the year so that we could unleash the social media ambassadors in support of those. And it worked really well. Like I said before, these volunteers seem to derive the most value from helping Cornell get Cornell business done. So we're pushing things like the Alumni Trustee elections. We're pushing things like Giving Day. We're pushing things like um, there was a, a memorial service for our president who sadly passed away earlier this spring. Um, that was, obviously we couldn't plan that one in advance, right? That was one that we fit into the calendar as it became um, a thing. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we can, we can hit these major punctuation points that need help, and those of course are the ones that we try the hardest to um, connect to various different sorts of metrics that quantify the impact of the social media ambassadors. And then we intersperse that with some lighter content to keep this from being all business all the time. Um, we also work with Advancement Communications and Central University Communications to use this resource on behalf of larger uh, communications initiatives, so that makes sense. But I think, I think having this be done in a planful and thoughtful way so that you can actually give the ambassadors a heads up of what's coming and why you're asking them to do it, that helps sort of solidify the glue of the ambassador community and make them feel like they're really doing something meaningful. Awesome. Kristen, uh, the other question we had, um, and I know we all had answers for this one, so I'll have Andrew weigh in as well. Um, is email dead in this age of tweets and Facebook posts and LinkedIn and integrating things with social media, social toasters and giving days and all of that? Are we still um, on track when we're sending emails to our alumni? I think we are. I don't think email is dead yet. 
I think millions of mass emails should be killed, but uh, I think what it comes down to is it's quality over quantity. You really have to think about the importance of saying, you know, less is more. Keeping it to, you know, what your audience needs. If you're seeing a lot of people unsubscribing from your email list, you know, when you're asking them to give every other day and volunteer and be a part of everything, then yeah, it's time to reassess email programs. But there are still emails. We send out some campus emails here from, I'm in Central Communication here at Union. And there are some emails we still see, a, you know, there are some emails we've seen a 70% open rate. So there are definitely is a time and place for email, but it just needs to be done elegantly and to the point. So you're not wasting everybody's time. Andrew, any thoughts on the, the email is dead question? I endorse everything Kristen just said. Um, it's not dead, but I think we can do it a lot more professionally and effectively. Also, I'm trying to pull up uh, one of the questions we had was about open rates and what our traditional open rates are. And, and Kristen, you mentioned it that you see some emails that just blow it out of the water. They make uh, they have fantastic open rates. Uh, on average, we at SU here in the alumni office were usually about 23, 24 percent um, open rates. We had a great success, and I'm trying to find the title of that email, and I'm in my email, and of course I can't find it. Um, in Generation Orange, it was a welcome to our to our new graduates, and we sent that out to our um, graduating seniors. Um, I believe it was the Monday after graduation, and we had a 71 percent open rate on that email, and and that was just using their Syracuse uh, syr.edu email addresses. So. For us, that was uh, very exciting and hopefully is the first step in keeping them engaged for a long time so that they will give us their new contact information so that they will become our social media ambassadors. Um, because really, you know, they're, they're our future alumni. Well, they're, they're our future right now. They're already our alumni and they're the ones who we're going to be relying on as uh, these initiatives continue to grow. Anything as we wrap up uh, with about three, four minutes left? Um, anything that both of you are really keeping an eye on? Is it is it Facebook Live? Is it Periscope? Is it a new tool or technology that's coming out that you think um, really is something to watch as fiscal year, oh gosh, are we in fiscal year 2018? Uh, continue. What, what are you thinking as far as tools to watch? Pokemon Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think a lot of schools are watching. I don't know if you're kidding or not, but I think a lot of schools are watching Pokemon Go. They totally, and there are some experiments uh, going on already. Now, I, I firmly believe that risk management is not watching Pokemon Go, and I bet <laughs> they will eventually be watching Pokemon Go pretty carefully. Um, honestly, the, uh, the big initiative that we have queued up for this year is not so much a new tool, but it's beginning to develop approaches to engaging international alumni using platforms that may be more widely used where they are than the ones that we normally use here. Um, so for Giving Day next year, we're in the early stages of mapping out a China strategy um, that's going to uh, use WeChat and um, perhaps bring some additional uh, video hosting and payment processing options on board to help us get more traction with the Chinese market. We're doing this because we know that a lot of the stuff that we do simply isn't accessible in China. Obviously, if you're posting your videos on YouTube, that doesn't work. If most of your paid social promotion is on, is on Facebook, that's not going to work. And we know from talking to our colleagues in international fundraising and alumni affairs, um, she actually had this, this terrifying account of a conversation with, with an alum, and she was sitting there, and she was saying, well, well Giving days next week, and he was like, "What are you talking about?" She was like, "You've gotten a million emails about it." And he went, and he was like, "Oh, I haven't opened up my email in in weeks." So he went and he opened it up, and sure enough, there they all were. But he's oh on WeChat. God. That's where the alumni community is. Um, so we feel like that's a that's a nice test case of of a very focused adaptation of a central marketing campaign through local channels, and that'll give us a pretty good index of how effective this approach is because we can compare the Giving Day 2017 results with the 2015 and 2016 results with a generic one-size-fits-all approach. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Awesome. Very cool. Kristen, how about you? I'm really excited to hear how Andrew makes out with the Chinese digital strategy. <laughs> I know. Um, That'll have to be a topic for a show. 
I know. That is um, the other thing that I'm really excited about. I think there is definitely a time and place for Facebook Live. We have seen great engagement on just some early videos. Again, it's like email, though. Like, you cannot Facebook Live everybody every day. But the organic reach on Facebook is pretty much as low as it's going to get at this point. So if you're looking to really break through and be seen by more people, things like video and face, especially Facebook Live, I think is a really good approach and something that we're really looking into more as well. We're thinking, too, we've got um, our reunion, homecoming reunion week, and we call it Orange Central here coming up. and. There's definitely going to be more of a push this year uh, for alumni who are attending to think about giving back to their alma mater. But also on the digital side, one thing we're doing, we have a reunion of the, we call them the chime masters, and they're the people who have, they rang the chimes in the Kraus Tower, uh, which is one of our iconic buildings on campus for years while they were here. And so these are alumni who might be many, many, many years out of the school. They're reuniting, uh, and they're going to get together to ring the Kraus chimes. That is one thing that we're thinking about putting up on Facebook Live, and there's a whole fundraising effort now to replace the chimes. So that's what we're thinking, using digital, being able to show our alumni, 20,000 of them on our Facebook page or whatever that is, you know, here are these, I'm just envisioning like a 75-year-old man ringing the chimes and like hearing that and, and seeing his pride for being able to come back and do something that he enjoyed as a student, and then being able to encourage alumni who maybe can't be on campus to support that initiative. So I know, Andrew, you do this all the time in terms of, of crowdfunding, showing specific efforts um, that are happening on campus and how alumni can take part. And I think Facebook Live is, is certainly going to be a hugely helpful tool for us to showcase those types of initiatives. All right. Well, any final parting words from my, from my partners in crime, Gosen, Gowan, and Brown? And just, I just love to say that. <laughs> no, we were tweeting about that leading up to our, our conference together. Uh, anything you think we missed on our conversation about these di digital initiatives and tying them into the bottom line? I think for me here at Union, I think it's, more, it's just about um, always moving forward and always seeing the new strategic opportunities. I think that's something for me that excites me most about my job is seeing how there's always more coming on the horizon, so how can social media play a role in those strategic initiatives? That's what I'm always thinking about. I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the potential impact of social, and we've been doing it for long enough now that we can actually answer the ROI question pretty effectively. Um, so what I think is that if you're still struggling with the ROI question, you may not be asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all, all of the examples that we've shared here are, are really good, tangible, concrete uh, examples of how you can actually, you can, you can do it. Um, but you do need to ask the right questions, and uh, you're never going to ask the right questions if you spend a lot of time worrying about what is or is not your job. I think digital is a sort of fluid, amorphous, all-encompassing thing, and it's only with partnerships that you're going to be able to answer some of these things. Awesome. Well, with those final words, I appreciate you both so much for joining us. To all of you who are watching the show, our episode today was really a, a fun one for all of us because it's what we do every day, and it's it's really um, important work. We feel, obviously, it's our, our jobs, but it's really uh, fun and rewarding as well. So thank you to those of you who weighed in with questions on the Higher Ed Live hashtag, and thanks, as always, to the sponsors of today's episode, we have iModules and M Stoner. Uh, I appreciate you, Kristen and Andrew, as always. Thank you for being part of today's episode, and thanks again to everybody for watching. Have a great day. <laughs>